put your hands together for the late morning program with your host, Nam Ross. You like that intro? <laughs> Um, a friend of mine from uh, London. <laughs> That's cute. Yes. So we're on with uh, Madhavananda Prabhu. Uh, this is the late morning program episode 21, I believe. Oh. Yeah, 21st episode. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, you're such a super interesting person. You travel all over the world. You have so much to share, uh, so much spirituality to share with everyone. And I, and I think we're going to get a really good... Um, Good stuff out of this episode. So let's start out by by uh, saying maybe, how did you come to Krishna consciousness or spirituality? Um, I wasn't satisfied. I, I, I was growing up in, in, in the early, late uh, early mid seventies, and uh, I wasn't satisfied with all the materialism and things that were going on. Right. If you could speak, sorry, but yeah. speaking to the mic. Yes. And I was looking for something more, and I started becoming interested in India when I was about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old. I came in contact with Prabhupada's books. It's like 1970, 71. Right. Uh, I, I was a young boy and going into an old abandoned house, and there was some pictures from Krishna book on the wall. And I... Uh, uh, I, I, I was taking pride in, myself, pride in myself that I knew something about different mythology, Roman and Greek mythology, and different religions. But I, I could understand this is something spiritual, but I couldn't figure out what in the world who's this blue boy and his girls and the cows and all this <laughs> stuff. I, I, it was, I would just stand there for hours and look at them and try to understand something about it. Around that time, I became a vegetarian, which was... Uh, very big shock for my family because we didn't know any vegetarians. I'd never read a book about it. Wow. It just, it was just, I just hated eating meat. Mm. And uh, somehow around that time we became like that. And then some years later, I uh, became more and more interested in India and I started chanting. I got, found some mantra in a book. We were chanting Govinda, uh, Govinda Jaya Jaya and Gopala Jaya Jaya, like that. Mm -hmm. And I met the devotees at a rainbow gathering in Washington State. And when I got out of high school, I decided that I want to understand what is the purpose of life. And although my parents were both teaching in the university, part of they were much academic, I uh, I wasn't satisfied with that, and I didn't want to just just get some education and get a house and a car and. and live like everybody else. So I thought uh, I, I should just wander around like a sadhu. Hmm. And so I was living in the forest. I hitchhiked from coast to coast a few times in America. I was living on an old abandoned boat by myself in Key West, Florida for a while. I was living in a cave in, uh, in Mount Lemon, Arizona. I uh, was a street musician sometimes. Really? And uh, we went to New Orleans and there was one uh, we started going to the temple because I was a vegetarian, and somebody told me the Hare Krishna people have good food. So we would go there, and I would stay after the program, and I would argue with the devotees because I liked philosophy, I liked discussion. Yeah. I was a captain in my debate team in high school. I never, never lost a debate, and until I met the devotees. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I would stay after the program, and I would discuss philosophy with them for hours, and they would defeat me and they would give me prasada garland and things from the deities i remember one day one of the boys came with a milk carton and he had some prasada milk sweets from the deity and he had this funny smile on his face he said prabhuji this is very special this has christian saliva on it <laughs> and i really I, I thought my god they got some guy behind the curtain who was like drooling <laughs> <laughs> on the sweets. So oh I, I, I carefully examined everyone. It's not a very cool thing to tell somebody. Right, yeah. But I, from that experience, I learned something about Kirtan. And then um, we visited another center too, and I, I, somebody gave me some Japa Mala. I started to chant. And then I went to live by myself in this cave, and I was trying to chant 16 rounds a day. And it was pretty boring hmm. to live in a cave by yourself. 
So I was there for a few weeks, and I finally decided I got to find the devotees. And I came down knowing that in Tucson, Arizona, at that time, there was no devotees there. But I uh, came down, and I met someone on the street, and I was telling him, yeah, I like the Hare Krishna people. They're really good. And he said, oh, you just missed them. They were just here at the university. But they left. And I was disappointed. And he said, but you know, the day there's a free sitar concert. And I like music very much. So I thought, well, I'll go to the concert. I went to the university, and I found the devotees were there, Madhura Prabhu and Charu and Krishna Kata and a few others. And oh, wow. They were all with Western clothes on, hats, and they had these exhibits, Festival of India and Vegetarianism and Reincarnation and Bhagavad Gita, but nothing directly about Krishna. And I went up to him. I said, hey, I know who you guys are. You're Hare Krishnas, aren't you? I can tell everything. And, and they gave me some prasadam. And, and Madhura Prabhu uh, invited me. He said, would you like to travel with us and, and be part of the festival? I said, well, yeah. And so he took me to Los Angeles and dropped me off in the Bhakta program. And that was 1982. Wow. And I stayed in the L.A. Temple for some years. And then later we were in... in uh, we helped run the preaching center in Boulder, Colorado, and then I was the president in Seattle, Washington. I was in Alachua for a while in Florida. Wow, different places. So you're you're known, uh, you know, in in the Isakhan community as being the one who wrote the uh, biography of Srila Gaurav Govinda Maharaj, your your Guru Maharaj, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, your relationship with him, how you met him. Uh, it's probably you know a, a great thing to share. Please share a little bit about that, uh, how you met him. We made this book. Uh, funny, funny story, which I told you. Uh, my mom is in the hospital right now. Uh, she's recovering from a knee surgery. And my brother-in-law brought her, her um, a book to read just randomly uh, on the day that I was there. And, and he brought this book. Uh -huh. And and I said, hey, do you know the author of this book is staying at my house today? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a w really amazing coincidence. But anyways, yeah, please uh, tell us about that the book and about meeting your the Guru Maharaj. Uh, well, the book, first of all, maybe I, I had a conception with the book, I, I which I expressed something in the introduction that I didn't want to get in the way of the reader. I wanted to allow the reader to meet him on their own. Of course, I have opinions, I have feelings myself, but people should get to know him on their own right? Uh, without having some pushy kind of crazy person. So I just had interviews and remembrances of Guru Maharaj that I strung together. And in the book itself, I think maybe one time there's a remembrance of myself, which I didn't even give my name, it's just in the footnotes or something, right. because I wanted to stay out of the way of it. Sure and allow devotees to come in contact with him. Because when I first met him, I was living in Alachua, Florida, and there was an old friend of mine, he's a Prabhupada disciple there, and he told me one day, he said, you, Gorgavinda Maharaj is coming, son. And I said, who's that? He said, you've never heard of Gorgavinda Maharaj? And I said, no. He said, oh, he's a Prabhupada disciple, and he's very controversial. I said, oh, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, some people say he should be the next Acharya, after Prabhupada, and some people say he should be kicked out of Iskon. Wow. Really? Wow. Well, well, <laughs> so, when Guru Maharaj came, I made sure to go to his class, and I was, it was nice. I, I really appreciated he was quoting so much Shastra, and he was very dynamic. And I attended some home program with him, and a few programs here and there, but I was frankly really put off by some of uh, the devotees who were around him. Interesting. Who, trying to push me. I was initiated. <clears throat> previously in his gone by someone who, who had difficulties and gone. Right. And I didn't uh, appreciate someone trying to push me in like that. And actually, we, we come to New York at one time, and uh, this was like 90, 91, 92, mm -hmm. and uh, Guru Maharaj was giving class in the temple, and I didn't attend any of the classes because there was one particular devotee there who was so pushy, and I just didn't like that. So I, I remember going out on book distribution every day while I was there. I was just visiting while we were traveling. And one morning I was dressed in Western clothes and I'm going out the front door of the temple. And I turn and there's Gorgavinda Marsh standing by himself with some suitcases. By himself. And I was by myself and I kind of looked at him and he looked at me. Hmm. And I just felt like this old sod of this old man, I should help him or something. And, but I, I just froze, and I offered obeisances to him, and, and I left. And I always lament. 
Ah. Uh, I could have come a little closer, but it was also a lesson for me that when we talk about relationships, and Guru is a very important relationship, it should be something personal. Hmm. And not just something someone pushes you into or some institutional thing. So I didn't do anything about it for a year or two. And Krishna gave me a big kick in my personal life. And uh, I had gone back to Los Angeles trying to get myself together. And I was going out every day to the airport in L.A. And, and I, was, I was crying. I, I was really, Krishna had taken everything away from me. I was going to Prabhupada's room every day by myself and just crying buckets of tears. And I was praying to Prabhupada, please, I need someone, I need some but I need someone like you. Hmm. I, I know now for seven years I'd gone without after my guru had left. I, I need somebody, but I need someone like you. And a little after that I, I ran into an old friend uh, who's my old godbrother Sanatan Das and I said, Hey Sanatan, where have you been? He said, I'm just coming from India. My name's Rasika Nanda now. I said, Oh God, you, you got initiated, who by? He said, oh, Gorga Vindamarsh. And he gave me some recordings of Guru Marsh. And I was listening to him while I cooked one morning, and Guru Marsh is speaking in such a dynamic, powerful way. I remember in the middle of cooking, I just fell down on the ground and offered obeisance as the tape recorder. Wow. <laughs> and then I decided that when this Maharaj comes, I'm not going to jump into initiation or anything, but I want to... I want to be around him. I want to develop a relationship. I want sure. to know him for a few years. And then maybe after a few years, I might ask him for initiation. So we drove from L.A. to Vancouver yeah. to get his association. And I traveled with him for a couple of weeks. And after a couple of weeks, I just realized this is my guru. And, wow. and I asked if he would give me initiation. Gurmash did. And a little after that, he asked me to come to India. Mm. And uh, I've been in Bhubaneswar and Narissa since 1993. Oh, wow. That's amazing that you've been there so long. That's, uh, we'll get on that after. But I want to ask you, a lot of devotees have had that experience where their guru has left. So what made you stick around? I, I was initiated by Rameshwar Prabhu, and I always appreciate him. He helped me a lot. It was a very painful thing. Sure. He left. It was heartbreaking. But one thing that he did is he always encouraged us to be close to Prabhupada and have faith in Prabhupada. And although the hardest thing of that to go through was to have your faith broken in someone that you saw as Christian's representative, I still had faith in the process. And I thought to myself, although he's had some problems and maybe he's giving up his part of the deal, so to speak, right. I made a promise also in front of the deities and things, so I'm not going to stop my chanting, I'm not going to stop this, I had faith in the process. So I continued like that, and mm. Krishna and Prabhupada took care of me. I had faith in Prabhupada. My Guru Maharaj later said, once uh, some group of devotees came to see him in London, in the manor, and they were all initiated by, formerly by one Iskand Guru who had left and had problems, and later they took initiation from one of Prabhupada's godbrothers. And they had a nice meeting. Gurmarj didn't know who they were initiated by. And after they left, Gurmarj asked who, who they connected with. And he told them the story. And Gurmarj's response was, although he, he had great regard for that godbrother of Prabhupada, he had some of his books and he spoke very highly of them, he said they made a mistake. Hmm. They should have depended on Shiva Prabhupada. And not because Prabhupada is the one or the institutions, but because they had some connection with him. Right. And they, they, they've done so much service for Prabhupada. And Prabhupada's real. It's not just a deity, an idol that we're worshipping, but Prabhupada's there. Right. And he, he spoke like that. Wow. So so then um, so now you are currently you are you're an author you you have this magazine and you live in Bhuvaneshwar. What do you do in Bhuvaneshwar? Is is writing mostly your thing? But also you travel. So tell us a little bit about your current activities. We I shifted to Bhuvaneshwar in 1993, and then gosh I don't know now. Six years ago, five years ago, we shifted to Jagannath Puri. Oh that's, Puri, okay. That's where I've been since then. Six months of the year, our current program is six months of the year we stay in Pori. And I'd like to do more writing, but our schedule there mostly is yatras. We have prakramas going on from pretty much from Kartik to Gaur Purnima. Wow. 
Every year we have a, a big festival in January. We have Vaishesh Guru who comes every year. We have a group of devotees from Ukraine, some Russian devotees usually, and different groups of devotees who come to Puri, and we take them around and we give them talks, uh, not just about the places, but I, I'd like to speak something about the ideas behind the places or the ideas that the places inspire. And then six months of the year we travel mostly in the West, in America and Ukraine and Europe and in different places like that. And we started Krishna Katamrita magazine wow. in uh, 1994. And uh, we've done 15 issues so far. We just finished one in Gorbada. And each issue is kind of focusing on a particular topic, like this is on Mahaprasad. This is a magazine that speaks about Patipav and Jagannath. Oh, right. You're the most merciful Lord, but only Hindus are allowed. <laughs> the irony how it is that Western devotees are not allowed inside the temple. Yes. This is one of my favorite issues. Putana, false gurus, institutions, and the holy name. Wow, that's a it's cool one. Kind of a, a very heartfelt topic for me, kind of why I'm still here. Sure. And Mahaprabhu Sanyas and different topics like that. That's amazing. So, to, so let's talk a little bit about... Um, like we were talking about things you're passionate about. That's what I like to bring out in people who come on this podcast. So uh, something that I know you're passionate about is community. So tell us a little bit about your observations of community in the West, in, the, in India, in ISKCON, uh, in other places. Just a little bit of illuminations. Well, just speaking from kind of a secular perspective, well, first of all, from a devotional perspective, you just imagine if you meet somebody on the street you've never met before, and you tell them, please come to our temple. We have such a big temple. It holds 10,000 people. Yeah. What will the reaction be? Uh, and, overwhelming, maybe? And, maybe? and if you meet somebody and you tell them, you know, we're really into community, and mm. come to my home and be my friend. Yes. What will the reaction be? Better than yeah, it, the other one. It's a completely different thing. Sure, sure. First of all, you're going to think this is like a cult and what are they doing? <laughs> and actually, Krishna consciousness is really based on community. That, that's the best way to spread bhakti and to experience bhakti. And if we see all over the world, the whole entire world was much more community-based 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we were speaking earlier about this, in terms of architecture, in America, everything, if you look at the architecture in the 1940s and the 1950s, everything was community-based, and there was a porch. And all that, when I grew up as a young boy, we had a big porch, and people would go for walks in the afternoon and the evening, and, and you'd say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Come here and sit down, and we'd give them some iced tea or something, and, and you'd meet people. And the, the porch is there because it's community. You want to meet people. Sure. But today we don't have porches. We have decks in yeah. the back. Yeah. It used to be in community. You knew who grew your food. You knew who, who uh, made your knife, who made your furniture and things. Mm -hmm. And today you don't know who makes it. You just, you're sitting on your back deck and you get a package from Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you, you don't meet anybody. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not community-based at all. And for devotees, there's a kind of sociological phenomenon uh, of conversion. When somebody changes their religion or they adopt a new religion, it's hard for them. I, I, I was a Bhakti leader for years in L.A., and I would see people would join, and their identity was in their hair, or their identity was in their Levi's and their record collection or something. Yeah. And they move into the temple and they lose their hair, they lose their jeans and their record collection. It's kind of like you can see it written all over their face. Yeah, Who am completely I? lost their identity. Yeah, and, and they're really nervous. Yeah. And it takes them some time. They don't even know how to wear a dhoti. They don't know how to put on tea lock. They don't know the verses. And they, everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants friends. And they, they're just in the bottom of the totem pole. So how can they make friends? The only medium they have is to be fanatical. Mm. And so that's kind of the short story of the Hare Krishna movement. Mm. In the West, the devotees were coming and they didn't know this culture. And, and they became more like fanatics. But when we can have community, we can get to know people, because the basis of community is trust. 
and you, you can't have trust in someone until you, you get to know them, until they live around you for some time. And it doesn't mean that everybody's perfect. Sometimes we have this idea that trust means that I'm only going to trust someone who is perfect in, you know, in so many regards. Right. But in, in communities all over the world, there was always crazy people. There were always people who had different mental problems or this or that. But there was trust with them still. They, they would know them. They'd know their limits. He's not going to do anything really bad. He's harmless. Mm. He's my crazy old uncle or whatever like that. And they could contribute something to the community because people would know each other. But in modern society today, you don't know your neighbor. People live in, a, in an apartment building and they, they, they don't even know who's next to them. Yeah. And Chaitanya Mungo Mahaprabhu gave a series of instructions to the, the residents of Nabadweep before he came to Puri. And I consider those three verses to contain like a nutshell of instructions for community. And the first thing he says is, Tomara Taki Bay. The first thing is, stay where you're at. Hmm. And that's, that's a very simple and a very profound thing. Yeah. Because how many people stay where they're at? The Hare Krishna devotees are terrible. Right, they're all shifting every few years and going, you, you were living in London a few years ago, <laughs> yeah. and now you're here. Right? <laughs> Everybody's moved all over the place. You, know, right, right? Right. you can't have a community unless you live in some place. You, you need elders. Sure. So, Tomara Taki Bay, that's the first thing. Stay where you're at, then you can develop some community, then you can develop your bhajan. You can grow roots, basically, right? Yeah. And then he said, that the next thing he says, Agya Kori Bhe Palana, you... Nourish this thing, Niranta Dibi Nishi Koribe Kirtan. You do this Kirtan day and night. This is my instruction to you. And this is how we develop community. But I've marked something about our community culture in ISKCON today, which is really beautiful. It's by Andrew Prabhu's mercy, I think we have so much more Kirtan going on. But I'm personally not fully satisfied. And I, and I spoke recently with a few senior Kirtaniyas, very famous persons. Maybe better I don't say their names. Sure, yeah, I don't say their names. Yeah. Because I'm going to say something a little controversial. Yes, I love controversial. <laughs> <laughs> and they agreed with me. I, I told them, I said, frankly, I'm not satisfied with a lot of the Kirtan mailers and programs. Mm -hmm. I said, it's great. I'm so happy to see people do Kirtan. But what is a conception? What is a joint conception? Some people come because there's kirtan gods, you know, the, the, the gods of rock and roll. Right. But it's like a concert program or something. And some people come because there's some cute girls there, <laughs> hot guys there, really. <laughs> yeah. Or, or my friends are there, or it's just a fun thing to do. Right. Or maybe somebody's coming to pray to the deity that I can get liberation. Mm. And maybe somebody else is praying for, you know, to get a good wife. Or maybe somebody's praying for it to be empowered for book distribution. There's so many different conceptions. Interesting. So we need Krishna Kata also. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said, just as you can't separate Krishna from his Sarup Shakti, you can't separate him from Radharani. Our purpose is to keep Radha and Krishna together. So he said, Krishna has come in the form of his name, and Radharani has come in the form of Krishna Kata. Oh, wow. And so both things are required. Srila Prabhupada would always have Krishna Kata along with Kirtan, even a little Kata. I know Madhav Prabhu, a lot of times when he's doing Kirtan, he'll say a few words. Janavi will say a few words sure. to try to bring people on the same page. Yeah. Because when there's a joint conception, mm. it's a very, very powerful thing. Yes, yes. There's a, uh, one of the Pajavali Kirtans about Mahaprabhu in Puri, describes that Chodi ke Mahanta Meli Kori e Kirtana Keli Sata Sampradaya Gaya Geet. That from all four directions, Chodi ke Mahanta Meli Kori e Kirtana Keli. From all four directions, the Mahants were coming together. Not just anybody, but the different Mahants from the Ramanuja Sampradaya, from the Madhva Sampradaya, different groups. Not just the rank and file persons again, but the leaders. Right. And Kirtan Kelly. Kelly means to have fun. Mm. Pastimes are doing Kirtan together. And it's described Sutta Sampradaya Gaya Geet. Now, hundreds of different Sampradayas were together in that Kirtan. Now, it's interesting to me that in Madhya Lila chapter 13 of Chaitanya Charitamrita, that word uh, Sampradaya appears a dozen times or so and is used to describe different associates of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm. Like the, the Advaita Sampradaya, and then Nichananda Sampradaya, Interesting. and Gadadhar, and you're feeling like, excuse me, um, I thought we were the Gaudiya Sampradaya. All right. right? Prabhupada translates it as groups. So why are there different groups? 
because of Krishna Kata. Kirtan is something everyone can come together, but when we want to come a little closer together, Kata is required. Mm -hmm. Then we come together closer in the heart. And therefore the Bhagavatam in the 11th canto is described Parasparanu Katanam Pavanam Bhagavad Yasa. The devotees should learn how to associate together by having Krishna Kata. But the Krishna Kata should be Paraspara, I, back, which means back and forth. Mm -hmm. I remember one temple we went to in Europe. I won't say places or names, but the temple was huge, huge building. You could hold... In the temple building, in the temple room, you could probably hold 500 devotees in one wow. really big temple room. And they were real sweet. They greeted us with kirtan when we came. And they brought us in, and we sat down to speak something. And there was about 10 devotees. And they were very embarrassed and apologetic. And so we're really sorry. We used to have a big community. There were so many devotees here. But now they're not here. And just something inspired me. I asked them, I said, well, why aren't they coming anymore? My Guru Maharaj used to say, Krishna Kata is so appealing. He see, told us, he said that we should work to help uphold the prestige of Prabhupada's mission. And the best way to do that is to have nice Krishna Kata and nice Vaishnav dealings because that's all attractive. So Krishna Kata is so attractive. Why aren't people coming? And I asked them that and they were a little taken aback that I was asking this question. And they were giving different answers. Finally, the temple president said, they're in Maya Prabhu. And I, I said, no, the, the Krishna Kata is all attractive. It, it attracted us when we were in Maya. Mm. That's not a satisfying answer. And they, they were giving so many different answers, and I rejected all of them. I finally told them, the reason why they're going, maybe we're not doing Krishna Kata properly. Maybe when we do Krishna Kata, we're trying to collect money. Maybe when we're trying to do Krishna Kata, we're doing Krishna Kata, supposedly, we're trying to control people. Mm trying to make members or become famous or do something else. If you study communication, everybody has some motivation. And I, that's why I don't like to give class, but I like to have kata. And the word kata is very different, the, the connotation, than class. If you have a class, it means I'm instructing you. Hmm. But if you have a kata, it means we're sharing something with you. Because a Vaishnava doesn't want to give instruction. He's not like that. We want to share something. So our program is not class. Our program is not a sermon in the church. Our program is not a commercial on television, although sometimes it may smell like it. <laughs> um, what? But our program is just something which is a hoitiki. And Krishna Kata should be done for the purpose of Krishna Kata. And if it's really sweet Krishna Kata, then it's just so wonderful. Mm. My grandma would tell a story. That one uh, wealthy man was there who had so many anxieties over his money and his many possessions, he couldn't sleep at night. And someone told him he should go to some sadhu, and this sadhu, he can maybe help you. And so he went to see that sadhu. The sadhu was giving some kata at that time. And uh, he, that, that wealthy man came in and sat down, and after a little while he fell asleep. And some of the sadhu's disciples were disturbed by that. They went to wake him up. And the sadhu said, no, no, no. This is the medicine. Let him rest. <laughs> and he slept from like, I don't know, 8 o'clock at night to 8 o'clock the next morning or something. Yeah. And when he woke up, wow, what a nice rest. And Guru Maharaj said, this is the nature of Krishna Kata, that it, it frees the mind. There's no anxiety. I'm not here to impress people. I'm not here because I have to be here. I'm not here to try to collect money. But it's just, there's no motivation. My only purpose sure. is, is simply to hear Krishna Kata and right. to relish that. And that's the basis of community. There's another verse in uh, Sattva Tatantra which describes Hari, uh, Hari Lila Suto Chara Parishi Sattva Tamtvaya Karya Pritistava Harayata Bhakti Nanashi. Priti means love. If you want to have love, you want to know how to love the devotees, then we should have Krishna Kata, Hari Lila Sutochara. The more we hear Krishna Kata from devotees, then love, loving relationships develop. But, Tomara Takibe, if we're not staying in the same place, it's very difficult. Or frankly, if we don't have faith in mm -hmm. devotees. And we see that because Hari Kata has been used in the wrong way for so many years, devotees have become discouraged. 
And sometimes they go to some sadhu outside of our society who may be doing Hari Kata in a very nice way. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask about that. What if the people? What if you're in an area where there's not anyone who you feel faith in, or that no one's doing Krishna Kata? You know, we, what, what, what is someone supposed to do in that? Well, why should we be envious? We should just go and hear Krishna Kata. But at the same time, there's some. We can speak like that, and sometimes devotees, they say, Prabhu, don't be so uptight. We can just go so many different places. Hmm. I live in India for the last 25, 28 years, and I, in the course of our research for our magazines and things, I've gone to many different sadhus at Radhakun and Jagannath Puri and Mayapur and Vrindavan. I've been to many different Gaudiya Mats, I've met many different sadhus who are very exalted, wonderful persons. And I would tell sure. my Guru Maharaj, I, I just went to see this person, I went to see Shila Narayan Maharaj, I went to see Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj, I went to see Bhakti Vaibhav Puri Maharaj, I went and met the Nanta Das Pandit at Radhakun, and this, right. looking for some information. Sure, sure. Things. And uh, I found an interesting principle is that in all those different Sanghas, they tell their followers, don't go outside. Don't go here and don't go there. They tell their followers. Everybody says like that. Sure, you, tell, sure. you tell your son like that. Don't, yeah. don't play in the street. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Because a, a child, if, you're, if your little boy is three years old, four years old, you tell him, don't go play in the street. Yeah. And he may say, why? And then what are you going to tell him? A, a dog may bite you. Someone may kidnap you. They, they may, a car may hit you. You just keep it simple. Sure. So, so you tell him, because outside, everybody's bad. Right? Yeah. And so you have a fence, and right. your little boy is standing on one side of the fence, and people walk by, and he shakes his finger and he says, You're bad. <laughs> You're bad. Yeah. And it's cute. Everybody yeah. laughs. Yes. Now, if the same little boy is a 35 year old man, yeah. and he's standing there still behind the fence, You're bad. <laughs> That's a little sick. It's yeah. a little weird. Why can't we have friends? Sure. I've seen Priscilla Prabhupada wrote a letter, one of my favorite letters that uh, I like to quote a lot, he, to uh, the then Governor General uh, of uh, Canada, Ronald Michener, in 1968, and Prabhupada described ISKCON. He said, the ISKCON is a non-sectarian society, it's a non-lucrative society, mm. he uses those exact words, <laughs> and he said, our members include people from uh, Hindu, Christian, Muslim, Sikh, traditions and he said they can keep their respective religions and still be a member of ISKCON. Well, that's a beautiful thing. The problem is not that, that there's saintly person speaking but sometimes there's a problem within our own Sangha and if people go it may be there may be some difficulty hmm. other people may follow it may, may create some disturbance but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be respectful doesn't mean we can't appreciate. Sure. And I, I've marked when we travel so many different types of people take up Krishna consciousness. We were telling you this story, and we go sometimes to uh, uh, Uzbekistan, and there was one lady coming to our classes regularly, and she was wearing a burqa every day. <laughs> and I inquired, well, I've never seen someone coming to the Hare Krishna temple wearing a burqa before. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out she's a Muslim, and she's doing namaz five times a day, her Islamic practice, and she's also chanting 16 rounds. A day, and she's, and, and she can't give up her Islam. And why should she have to give up her Islam? Mm. That was Prabhupada's idea, not that we're creating a religion, and not that these people are good and these people are bad. We're good because we're Iskan, and those people are bad because they're Gaudiya Mutt. Mm. I, it's a difficulty in our society. It's a difficulty in terms of our preaching. When you tell people that this is the highest philosophy and we love everybody, but those guys across the street are dressed exactly the same way as we are, yeah. who chant the same mantra and do the same stuff, they're bad. Yeah, that's. But we're all about love. <laughs> yeah, that, that's. It's a like, little weird. <laughs> like we can go listen to like some mm -hmm. like uh, you know some Christian speaker speaking at a mega church or something like, the like the, they're giving some wonderful cla uh, you know big sermon or something. Well, devotees, you tell a devotee, oh, I went there to hear that Christian man speak. Oh, that's cool. You tell that same devotee, oh, I went to the Gaudiya temple to hear so-and-so march speak. <gasps> really? Oh my God, are you kidding? Why, why would you do that? Like, it, it makes no sense to me. But, but yeah, I mean, it's true that we, we have to be more, you know, less sectarian. And well, if you look also in terms of history, it's an interesting thing that 
like when I was about six years old, my parents were taking me to a uh, Baptist church. And at the age of six, they decided to change to a Methodist church. Okay. I can't tell you what's the difference All between right. the Baptists and the Methodists. I, I really don't know. Yeah. But I remember my grandmother cried for about two weeks. Really? She said, because you're all going to go to hell. Oh, my God. And if you look amongst Christian groups that are very close, they don't always get along. Hmm. And, and it's hard for them to discuss. They can discuss maybe with Muslims or with Hindus or sure. something. But to discuss, if they're a Presbyterian, to discuss with a Catholic hmm. may be hard for them. Yes. So I can understand yeah. for devotees. But it's, it's detrimental for our preaching if we hate anyone, maybe they're a Christian, maybe they're sure. Muslim, but if they're a good person, we should appreciate that. Definitely. Because our purpose is to create saintly persons, not, not to create a religion or something. So it's detrimental for our mission, and it's detrimental for me as an individual. Sure. Uh, if I don't give respect to everyone. Ese Vaishnava Dharma Sabare Pranati. In Chaitanya Bhagavat, Vrindavan Das Thakur says, this is the nature of a Vaishnava. He gives respect to everyone. But he says that there's another type of person who's a Dharmadvaji, who's just acting like a devotee. And they, he says they don't have any taste hmm. for this kind of thing. So we should be very, very careful. We don't want to just uh, promote an institution, but we want to carry on the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And to do that, we do through our Guru Janas. And we want to be nishta and vexed and respectful to our Guru Dave. Mm -hmm. I, I always, Shil Narayamars is controversial sometimes with devotees in ISKCON. Sure. And then they say, well, he's telling people that, that he was Prabhupada's Siksha disciple, but then they complain, why didn't he come and help Prabhupada? Hmm. And I say, well, there's a very good reason, perfectly good reason why he didn't come and help him, because he had something more important to do. What's more important? To serve his Diksha Guru. Yes. Srila Bhakti Pragin Kesha Maharaj. And he was serving his Guru Maharaj's mission. Yes. And he was appreciating Srila Prabhupada, but he couldn't work with that mission because he had, he had his own Guru's mission. That, that's my understanding of that. Sure, sure. Uh, so you also um, were talking about communications. That's another thing that you're really passionate about. Tell us a little bit about maybe something uh, regarding communication. Well, a big thing for me is the way devotees give class. I, I don't like the word class, and I don't like the word preach. Yes. We, we either, the word kata is much better, and the word prachar is much better. Mm -hmm. Prachar means to spread something, to share something. Mm -hmm. And kata means to speak, whereas to, to, to give class has another kind of connotation. And the word uh, preach in the dictionary, it also has a negative. If you, if you say, I preach to you, yeah. you, know, you say, quit preaching to me. <laughs> it's a negative kind of thing. Sure, sure. So we should focus on Krishna Kata, and that was something my Guru Maharaj stressed so much. He said that this thing, that this is the best way to help Prabhupada's mission, is they have nice Krishna Kata. So we try to do this with Krishna Kata Reader Magazine. And there's no advertisements except for our books inside of it. Amazing. And we try to have some nice artwork, and, and we do research on things. Sure. And there's just no motivation for it except to promote Krishna Kata. And our other motivation, we want to help Prabhupada's mission. Hmm. We want to encourage devotees. Those are honest, obvious kind of uh, uh, motivations that we have. But we'd like to encourage devotees to think. Part of the problem, perhaps, in, in uh, speaking, the Padma Purana says that Ashradhanai uh, Vimukhi Prashin Vitigas Chopadesha Siva Nama Paradha. There's different types of persons you shouldn't speak to, should not speak to. And the first is someone who's Ashradhan, who doesn't have faith in you. And so, in our society today, a lot of devotees have faith in Kirtan, but they don't have so much faith in speakers. And that's not the faith of, fault of the common devotees. It's not necessarily anybody's fault. That's just a, a situation in the society today. Faith in the devotee, in the person, meaning like just as a devotee? Faith in the speaker, faith in what he's speaking. Okay. So the, how does that faith come? By his behavior. Right. But also by what he's speaking. And if they're just speaking very common things and they don't want to quote Shastra, people are not going to have as much faith right. in that. So I, I, I personally, my grandma once told me that uh, if someone asks you to speak, you have no choice. You must 
and he jammed his finger in my chest really hard. Really? And he said, but don't think about, you just repeat what you've heard from your guru and the previous acharyas, and he jammed his finger in my chest and said, don't think it belongs to you. Wow. So now somehow we're constantly traveling and six yeah. months of the year at least and giving classes. And it's an interesting thing, uh, you know, growing up in ISKCON, I'd like to be the one giving the class. And I, I was doing public speaking before I was a devotee. I was involved in debate. I was a coach for mm -hmm. the debate team and things. And I knew about public speaking. And, and when I would watch some of the devotees give class, honestly, I would think, I could do better than that. <laughs> right. <laughs> the new bhakta. But uh, I never, ever pushed for that. And over some years, Krishna's made some arrangement and, and, and we're given some opportunity that we always had some desire to be in that situation. But now I see really that the, the devotees who speak have an obligation, that they should just represent our... our it's like a pujari. Yeah. I can give you an example. If you were asked to do the artik for Radha Madhav in Mayapur on uh, Gaur Purnima morning, <laughs> and you come out and there's 10,000 devotees, in the temple room, yeah, and you're thinking, wow, and you come out and you think, they're all here to see me. <laughs> so Nam Rasa if you think like that, you're you're a big time illusion. <laughs> they're not there to see you. Yeah, they're there to see Radha Madhav. Yeah, and you're just a flunky. You're just waving some incense and doing something on behalf of your guru, because sure. he can't be there. Sure. And so that's the same thing with the speaker. If the speaker's just a flunky, and he's just repeating something else that he's heard, it doesn't belong to him. It's not his material, and the inspiration comes from Guru. Hmm. The instruction to do that comes from Guru. It doesn't belong to him at all. He's just doing it on behalf of Guru. For the Vaishnavas, and if we have that attitude, then it, it changes the whole atmosphere. Hmm. And, and then things become a lot more loving. Then there's paraspara, there's some give and take. It's not that we're giving a sermon to people and you guys are really lucky that I'm here <laughs> to give some blessing to you or some horrible thing like that. But there's some uh, some sweet exchange with devotees. That, that's a very, very important thing. It, I think it's hard for us coming in the West coming from a Judeo-Christian background. And honestly, iskon has been affected a lot by that. By yeah. A lot of the early devotees who came from that background and we carried those conceptions to preaching and to giving class. Right. And different things like that, and, or devotees want, they, they think we, to give class means you should only speak for half an hour and you shouldn't quote so many verses, you should only quote things from Prabhupada's books. I have no problem with that. Yeah. I, I know one temple, they, they have a rule, you're not allowed to, to quote anything outside of Prabhupada's books. Mm. I said, well, that's okay. If you really do that, that's very sweet. Mm -hmm. But don't disappoint me and start quoting things from the newspaper. Right. Or from CNN or something. Yes. And then get on my case because I quote Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. <laughs> right. Or Baladi Vidyabhushan or something like that. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's just a symptom of uh, growth as a society. A society is like a, a, a person. When we go through our babyhood and we're trying to walk, when we go through our passionate youth, when we have later years of wisdom. And society is in a similar kind of situation. That's a really good segue into what I want to talk about next. Uh, you've traveled so much throughout ISKCON and all over the world. What do you think is lacking, uh, or what can we do a little bit better that can help improve the, the just the society as a whole? Hmm. I'd like to see more high-class Krishna Kata. I'd like to see devotees speaking it in a very detached way, in the mood of a sadhu. One wonderful saint that we have in our society today who has affected this society so much is Ayendra Prabhu. And what did he do? He didn't travel everywhere and give classes, mm -hmm. but he just sat down and he set an example sure. of someone who wasn't interested in position, wasn't interested in money or anything. And that touched the heart of thousands of devotees all over the world. Yeah. It's a very, very powerful thing if we're very sincere and we just depend upon Krishna for that. Uh, Krishna Kuna, we have no income, we have nothing, we just, Krishna takes care of us. Right. I, I don't want to be a prostitute. That That's a very important thing. Wow. I don't want to be dependent on someone. When we make our magazines and things, I've never gotten one penny from the institution to do that. Yeah. And that's a very important thing for art in general. 
uh, I, I, how can we make our society better? I think if we can understand that Krishna consciousness is an art. Hmm. Uh, sometimes when we express, uh, try to express bhakti to new people, I compare it to art because we, we tell them that, that the closest thing in this material world to bhakti is art. And the two have many, many things in common. Hmm. Both of them should be original. If you have a song and you just rip somebody else off for the lyrics or, or the chords or something for it, that's not original. Right. And the same thing with bhakti. I can't just imitate someone else's bhakti. It should be original. Both art and bhakti should touch the heart. should move someone. Both art and bhakti shouldn't be done for money. If someone's doing art for money, they're not really an artist. They're just a commercial person. If someone's doing bhakti for money, what is that? That, that? That's not appropriate at all. You may have an art school where you have a thousand students. And out of a thousand students, maybe two might actually become real artists. Or doing something from the heart in a real original way. And 998 will be craftsmen. And they can make circles and faces and draw different things. Yeah. But they don't know how to express something really from the heart and communicate that. And a similar thing, we may have a temple and 998 people may be religious. But you may have two persons who really have Sudha Bhakti, pure Bhakti. And as a society, we should keep a focus on that should always focus on pure bhakti and the desire to have that and have faith that that thing can come. Krishna can send such devotees. Yeah. And that, that's our purpose. That's what we want. We want pure devotion. We don't want to just to, to work hard or do some ritualistic thing. Then we'll become like what Prabhupada called churchianity. Churchianity. I, I, I understand what you're saying about the, the Krishna Katha thing. So is it... Can we can we like listen to it on a computer, like or on a, on your headphones? Is that a substitute to hearing it, like, or discussing it in in person? Well, let me ask you: w What if y your parents decided to have an arranged marriage for you? Let's not tell Tulsi about that. <laughs> Just pretend you're not married. Sure. And your parents have an arranged marriage for you, and they tell you we have this girl, and she's fantastically beautiful. Mm -hmm. She has all the right proportions and all the right places <laughs> and uh, she's very submissive and she's a great cook and she's very kind and gentle she's a really nice devotee and another perk her father's a multi-billionaire oh, and, wow. like and she's a great devotee and only one problem you'll never get to meet her <laughs> but, but you can talk to her on the phone once a week would you be satisfied with that definitely not I, I, anybody who wants a relationship it, there's something more. It's nice to listen to recordings, and we get great inspiration from recordings. We get great inspiration from reading books. But it's not that, that uh, ink and paper gives us bhakti, mm. but it's a person. Bhakti stu bhagavad bhakta sangena parijayate. Srila Prabhupada, uh, he spoke so many times that I'm non different from my books. But Prabhupada sometimes also said that, that although this recording, you're making a recording and it looks like I'm present, I'm not. Wow, he said that? Several times. He says in his books, too. So it looks like he's present, but he's not. And of course, it, just like if you're sitting upstairs in the Brahmacharya Ashram and you're watching a video of Prabhupada, of your Gurmarsh, and some devotee comes in and says, Prabhuji, Gurmarsh just walked in downstairs and he's giving class. <laughs> and you say, I don't need to go down. I, I'm watching a video. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yes. But it's not the same thing. Yeah, no, it's not. There's a difference. Wow. There's a difference in our relationship. And we should be greedy. Bhakti means that we should be greedy for relationships, to going deeper. But it doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with there's something wrong with the tapes. Mm. And it doesn't mean that, that we can't make a connection to them. But it's not as much a connection. And we shouldn't be satisfied with it. We should want something more. I want. I want to see that person. I don't want to just talk to them on the phone. So we should strive to, or, to strive to go to the places where there's Krishna Katha going on. Yeah, and where there's devotees. Or how do we find it? My Gurmars uh, repeatedly. We, we we made a little book called How to Find Guru. Mm. And the basic premise of that is is that Guru is always present. Krishna is always present. But uh, Krishna says, Sangsara Vaishnava Adino, Deva Vaishnava Palitaha, that there's proof that there's a pure devotee present. Krishna says this in Padma Purana. That uh, the proof is that the sun is shining. The proof is there's oxygen. 
mm. because Deva Vaishnava Palitaha, all the, the devatas, the demigods, air and sunshine, etc., are nourished by the demigods. Mm. Sangsara Vaishnava Adino, without the presence of a pure Vaishnava, the universe couldn't be here. And Krishna says, uh, was it... Uh, he said, what to speak of the demigods, I myself, aham cha Vaishnavadinas, I can't exist wow. without the presence of the Vaishnavas. So if some community, the devotees are chanting the holy name with inspiration is going on, there must be some pure Vaishnav. And we don't know who it is. It might be the, the guru, the sannyasi. It might be the temple president. It might be one of the brahmacharis. It might be one of the housewives. It might be one of the small children. Hmm. We don't know who it is. And we should be looking, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, when we speak about community, in Chaitanya Sikshamrita, he speaks about eight different reasons for giving respect. Because respect is kind of the glue that everyone looks for in all relationships. That's the basis of your marriage. Right. You respect your wife. You may be friends with her. Sometimes maybe sometimes you're not such good friends. You may be lovers sometimes, but other times not. Right. But respect is a basic principle that should always be there in all types of relationships. So he says the first respect is Nara Matreda Mariyada, that you should respect anyone who's a human being. But more than that, he says Subyatera Mariyada. We respect anyone who is a cultured person. Maybe someone's a human being, but they're a headhunter. Hmm. He's a head. I respect him. He's a human being, but I don't want to go to lunch with him. Hmm. He's a headhunter, but I, I can respect someone who, more who's who's cultured. And then Vidya Maryad is someone who has knowledge. Uh, Raja Maryad is someone who has uh, who's a, has a position. We respect them more than Subhutera Maryad than Raja than uh, Vidya Maryad is someone who has knowledge. Someone who has good qualities. Someone who uh, is acting according to their varna. We give more respect. Someone who's acting according to their ashram, especially sannyas. But Bhaktivinoda says the eighth and most important type of respect we give is bhakti maryada. Someone who has bhakti. And it may be a five-year-old child. Right. It may be a housewife. You know, she's, what is she? She's just a housewife taking care of children. But she may be a pure devotee. Mm. So if we can keep that value... Values are a very important thing. Value is, is a carrot which dangles in front of the donkey of society. So uh, preachers in our movement, devotees, need to constantly speak about what is real value. And real value is Sudha Bhakti yeah. in association with, with pure devotees. So if we keep those values, then the society will go in that direction. Whereas if our value is money, then we're going to respect some guy who comes in he's, and gives a big donation, but maybe he uh, deals with pornography hmm. or something. We may, we, give, we may give more respect to him than the brahmachari who wears two different colored socks <laughs> but because he, you know, he may be a pure devotee, the brahmachari, but he doesn't give any money. Right. So we don't give so much respect to that. Do you think we focus too much on money in Iskana, I'll answer that myself. I feel like, I feel like we do. <laughs> yeah. But I'd like to hear your. Um, it, it, it's funny, uh, you know. I I did. Uh, I talked to Brahma Mahorta about Kailash uh, sponsorships. <laughs> uh -huh. That's something I'm I'm kind of passionate about in the sense of how we should try to uh, support the temples in a kind of not. I wouldn't say dishonest, but in a more in a way which is which doesn't involve mixing bhakti and like monetary things, you know, like kind of what you were saying. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? It, well, obviously, if, if you have a class or something, you see, and now for the low, low price of only four ninety nine, you too can have your own. You know, it, it, it really hurts people's hearts. People are thinking, I came here for something genuine, and now there's this thing. Uh, but how did that come about? If you study the history of ISKCON, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, this book, um, Radha Dhammada Vilas by Vyasaki Prabhu. Yes, great book. The first volume is very interesting. If you read that, he makes a good case. He presents our history that it all started based on art and music. Mm. Vishnu Janam Maharaj in America, he was traveling with, with a traveling road show. And people who were joining w were idealists. And they were, they were poets and musicians, and, and they were coming, playing musical instruments and things. And that was their inspiration. But then later on, we became a little more corporate. Mm. And the focus became uh, on money and men and buildings. And Prabhupada was encouraging that. 
he saw we have this passion in America and devotees want to do that thing. I, I saw an internal memo from one temple, major temple in Iskon, I won't say where, and it was a list of people that, you, that the preachers should focus on in the university, and it was a list of people they shouldn't waste their time with. I was a little shocked. Interesting. The, the people that they should focus on were doctors, lawyers, dentists, uh, managers, business people, like that. Those are who they should focus on. The people they shouldn't waste their time with are people who are studying music or art or poetry, literature, yeah. and like that. I, I was a little shocked because I never would have joined hmm. in that case. So iskon has gone through different stages and there's been a very passionate stage of money. And I see a lot of devotees are, are unhappy with that. As Gandhi once said famously, that, that we should be, what is it, uh, we should be the... Uh, uh, be the change you want to see in the yeah, world. be the change that we want to see. So when devotees see that, that people think that things are becoming so much commercial and based on money, then we should be the change. Yeah. And it's a powerful thing. And, and we may not be a big, big manager. Sometimes I see devotees claiming, uh, complaining about managers. And I think to myself, gosh, they really have a lot of faith in the system of management. Mm. With all respect, if any GBC devotees or anybody watching this, sure. I, I respect the GBCs and managers. I hope they're watching. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't really care so much. I, it, just like Indra comes and Indra goes. Right. So GBC members come and go, and it's an important position. Devotees should respect authority. Otherwise, how will things go on? But the real essence of the movement is not managers. The real essence is Sudha Bhakti. Yeah. And when people just complain about the managers, what that tells me is that they see management as a solution. And I, I never really saw that as a solution. That's a really interesting perspective. And a solution is Krishna Kata. A solution is Krishna Nam. It's not that if we have perfect management, it's going to solve everything. Yeah. And then we're going to just get some Wall Street people in or something like that. And, and, and that's, that's not going to solve the problem. I, I, I was reading, I, was, I went on VedaBase, not VedaBase, Vanipedia on, online, and I, and I clicked the category of GBC and everything Prabhupada said about GBC. Just curious about it today. And, and one of the quotes that stuck out to me, he said, uh, GBC mean GBC man means that they go around to all the temples and make sure that everyone's chanting and everyone's reading. Right, that's the main function. And, and he said, and he said, not that not to uh, to 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 for everyone to get this voucher that oh how many books are how many books are being distributed or how many books do we have left in the in the you know in the in the warehouse that's secondary he said, but primary is that we. Make sure that he goes around, the GBC man goes around, make sure everyone's chanting Hare Krishna properly. Yeah, Prabhupada's desire was that all the temples be autonomous. Yes. And, and you'd have dynamic, charismatic persons who were leading, because that's the nature of bhakti. Bhakti and communities, it's the nature of community to have a good leader who everybody's inspired by. And if you're not inspired by that person, today I would suggest go somewhere else. Yeah. Give him a break. L l you know, follow somebody that you feel some inspiration in. It, it's a really important thing. When I hear devotees sometimes complain about the GBC, I feel sad. Yeah. I, I have some friends who are GBC members, and they, one of them told me it's a very difficult thing. If you just tell someone you're a GBC, then automatically there's a stigma. Sure, there's such a huge stigma. And, and, but devotees don't understand. They're a person. Just like I saw Facebook is a great place for quarrel and, and, and argument. <laughs> Yeah. I, I saw one very senior devotee, very senior devotee, who's outside of ISKCON that I respect. One, he's making some criticism of ISKCON at one point in, in, in a public discussion in Facebook. And I jumped in and I said something. And I said that uh, it makes me depressed to see that someone's been chanting Hare Krishna for over 50 years and is still going to treat me like an institution, like I'm ISKCON, or like I'm an American, or like I'm a male. Right. I don't want to be treated like Iskan. I don't want to be treated like a male. I don't want to be treated like an American. I want to be treated as a spirit soul. Right. And similarly, it's a shallow thing. People say, well, we should be broad-minded and we should go deep. And those GBC people, what does it mean to be a GBC? They're also spirit souls. <laughs> They're also individuals. And if you treat them as a category, you take away their, their personality, their identity, then you're doing the very thing that you're criticizing them for. Brilliant. It's true. That's very true. So people are people. I'd like to get to know people. And there's some great people in the GBC body, and there's some people that 
I'm not so close with and I keep a distance from maybe. Sure. That's just life. Yeah. And some of them make mistakes sometimes. Sometimes it, but that's their job. And I, I suggest to people, if you want to have a life full of bhajan, if you want to have a simple, happy life, then you should uh, give respect to the leaders. Because if you don't respect the leaders, then you may become a leader. And then your bhajan and your peaceful life is going to be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great sacrifice, especially today. In, in the early 80s when I joined ISKCON, to be a temple president was like being a god. It was a big thing. And today it's just like you're the, you're the flunky dishwasher. And <laughs> you're, you're a demon, you know. Nobody cares for you. Right, right. It, it's a great sacrifice. We should respect that. We should be individuals, strong individuals. And treat people. A strong individual is someone who treats other people as individuals and doesn't just treat them, oh, you're a Godia mutt. Or you're a brahmachari, or you're a grihasta, you're a householder, you're a GBC, you're a this devotee or that. But they're people. Hmm. We need to stop seeing everyone as upadis or designations and see them as persons. And if we're strong like that, that that's the, I feel the strongest, the best contribution we can make to the society. Hmm. That's, that's really a great advice. Um, what do you think... Uh, is lacking not lacking but if someone wants to become deeper in their christian consciousness because i I, when i when i hear what you're saying it seems that you have like a lot of depth in your christian consciousness and it's really coming out in in this interview what 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 did you do to to get that depth and what how can we get that depth Bougie, I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't have Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, but but honestly speaking I don't have any depth. Sometimes people they say things like that. Oh he thinks like this. But I I have no brain. <laughs> My whole brain was just saturated with sense gratification and, and smelled bad and everything. And then I came to my Gurmaraj and he did an operation. He took my brain out and he tried to put some Shastra in it. Right. And Shastra is just like a computer you stick in there. And that's like Vaidhi Bhakti. Hmm. And, and but during that Vaidhi Bhakti we should be following someone that we love. Jiva Goswami in Bhakti Sandarbha, he says that in the big that hearing is so important. We say Shravanam Kirtan and Vishnu Smarna. Shravan or hearing is the first thing. So in the beginning we're hearing from many different people and it's like Kitri. Kitri is just something you throw together with whatever is in the kitchen, right? Yeah. So we're hearing in a random way from so many different people. But after a while, there's one person that we're very attracted to because we like their mood. Yes. Not just the information that this guy, he's an information walla. He knows Sanskrit, he knows grammar, he knows this and that and so much information. But someone has something deep in their heart. And then we want to start hearing more from that person. Shu 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 should have done a Shavasudeva Katarachi Shan Mahatseva Vipripunya Tirtana Seva. When we do that service to that person, then we get some Kataruchi. Mm. And then we get a brain transplant and we start to see things in a different perspective. So, by the mercy of my Guru Maharaj, by the mercy of, of higher Vaishnavas, I had some good fortune to associate with, like Fakir Mohan Prabhu, mm. who passed away a couple of years ago. And I had a little association with Shul Narayan Maharaj and, and some other Vaishnavas. I've got some idea how to think, mm. and I'm trying. I, I learned from my mother and my father. That's probably the biggest gift they gave to me, was how to think. Mm. And, and see things from different perspectives. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, and so Artha Varshani, his commentary in Bhagavad Gita, in the 12th chapter, he says there's three stages of bhakti, uh, mm. abhyasa, manana, and smarana. Krishna the Gita says abhyasa, yoga, yuktena, mm. you practice. Abhyasa means practice. Yes. So in the beginning we're practicing and we're, we're not thinking anything, it's just mechanical what we're doing. But after some time our heart becomes purified and we start thinking then, well, why am I doing this? Why am I cleaning the temple room? Because it's pleasing to Prabhupada, because it's pleasing to the deities, because when people come, it's inspiring to see how clean it is. And then your bhakti starts going faster when you start practicing manana. And then you come to the point of marana. Marana means smarana. Marana means death. Hmm. When we, when we're, our, all of our material desires and, and, and contemplations have gone away, and then smarna comes automatically. Krishna comes to our mind in a natural way. We're natural devotees. So that's a really important function for guru. It's an important function for disciple to try to learn to think 
the way Gurudev has given us. Not just to collect all the information Gurudev has given. In the third canto of the Bhagavatam is a nice verse. Uh, I think it's spoken by Vidura to Maitreya, where Vidura speaks about his qualifications. He says, I've taken whatever I can remember that I've heard from my Guru, and whatever I've understood from that. Hmm. Because who can remember everything? Yeah. The guru says, who can understand everything their guru says? But it funnels down, and there's some things I've understood, some things I've heard. And guru gives us not, not just information, but he gives us a perspective right. by which to see things. So I would strongly suggest that in answer to your question. Mm. If we want to go deep, we should have a proper perspective. But that perspective comes by doing service, loving service to someone, and we, we adopt their perspective. Right. Um, maybe this might be a sensitive issue, but oh, good. <laughs> when, when, when I know that you know in the future for 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 some of us, you know, uh, our gurus are not going to be around, and uh, that scares me. So maybe you can give some illumination or experience from uh, when your guru Maharaj left, how painful it was, and how you kind of got over, or maybe you haven't got over, but kind of how you navigated that. I was in Mayapur when Guru Maharaj left. Actually, I'd gone to see him just a few hours before he left. Really? And he was perfectly fine. There was absolutely nothing wrong with him physically. Oh, my gosh. And it's a long story. I, I don't, maybe some devotees haven't heard it. We wrote something about it in a biography. Okay. Uh, a couple of devotees came to see him as one Prabhupada disciple, Madhaji, and one other Madhaji was married to a senior devotee. And they asked a question. Why did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu go to Jagannath Puri? Why didn't he come to Vrindavan? And Guru Maharaj spoke this story. A lot of devotees know by now. We, we call it Three Logs of Wood, about Krishna's returning to Vrindavan mm. and assuming this Mahabhav Prakash form of Jagannath when he meets Radharani. It's a very, very deep, very esoteric story. And when he was telling that story, I spoke with those ladies later on. I interviewed them for a book. And one of them told me that that tears started coming to his eyes. And the other one said that his voice became choked up. And then at a certain point he said, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't speak anymore. And they left. And then Guru Maharaj turned to the devotees in the room and he told them, I, he asked for his picture of Gopal. And Gopal is a deity that he grew up with as right. a young boy. It's on one of the covers of, of yeah, the book, right? we made a book, of Gopal Jew. Right. The beloved deity of Gorgavinda Maharaj. Mm -hmm. The, the deity's there, and there's a picture here also. I don't know, oh, beautiful. That can be seen or not. But Gopal was in their family for over 350 years. And Gurmaj always traveled. I was Gurmaj's servant um, for about a month and a half on one occasion. And that was one of your main services, is to set up the picture of Gopal, wherever he was. Oh, wow. So he asked for that picture, and then he told the devotees, Kirtan Koro, you chant. And they started chanting, and he said the name Gopal, and he closed his eyes, and that was the last thing he spoke. He laid back in the bed. And later I spoke to Dhammadar Swarup Prabhu, who has a Ph.D. in Ayurvedic medicine, who comes from a family of Ayurvedic physicians for many generations, who Dhammadar Swarup won a, a gold medal from the World Health Organization for successfully treating AIDS patients. Wow. He's an amazing Ayurvedic doctor. Wow. Bhakti Rupa was in the room, and he saw Guru Maharaj close his eyes like that, and he fell unconscious, and the devotees were panicking, and Bhakti Rupa ran out to get a doctor, and he went to Dhammadar's group. And Dhammadar came up, and he took Guru Maharaj's pulse, and he later told me that initially he was there. The pulse was still going. And he said then a few minutes later he checked again, and he'd left. And he told me, Dhammadar Srupa also grew up in a Vaishnava family. He said, it's an amazing thing. I've never seen a death like this. Wow. He said that he had all the symptoms of us as above. Amongst the different four types of separation, the most intense is called Sudura Prabhas, or separation from a distance. And there's ten different symptoms, dasa dasa, ten different symptoms of Sudura Prabhas, the last of which is Mrityu, or death. And he said, this is what happened to him. I've never seen anything like that. So I was over in uh, one of the ashrams, and some devotee came and, and told us this horrible news. We couldn't even believe it. 
I, it, it was it was such a shock for us. And Gopal Krishna Maharaj, I remember, very kindly saw what a horrible situation it was for the devotees, and he gave us a bus. And the devotees, we, we got in the bus, and some devotees took Guru Maharaj's body back to Bhubaneswar. And we rode back in that bus, and I remember, it's like a, I don't know, eight-hour drive or something. And uh, I don't remember anything about that bus ride. It was just like everything was red. Hmm. It was just, uh, we couldn't even think. And we got back. I was one of the, we, we, we dug a hole in the ground in Guru Maharaj's Bhajan Kutir, and we put his body in Samadhi maybe 24 hours or more after he'd left his body. His body, I was one of the devotees who, one of the persons who lowered his body into the ground. And uh, his body was like a rag doll. And it was completely loose. There was no rigor mortis. Wow. And his body, it wasn't warm. It was cold, but it wasn't ice cold. It wasn't like, I've, I've seen, I've done pujas and things for corpses. Yeah. It wasn't like an ordinary corpse. It was like, un, like something I'd never seen before. Wow. And then we were very, very confused. We, we didn't know what to do. And honestly, at that time especially, we didn't have a lot of faith. And a lot of the ISKCON leaders had been some disagreement of things. And so I, shortly after that, I went back to Mayapur, and a few of us went to see Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Marsh, Prabhupada's godbrother. Wow. Who my Guru had some appreciation for. And we said, Maharaj, our Guru has left, what should we do? And he said such a beautiful thing. He said that you should not think that your Guru is gone, but you should think that he's just in the bushes watching you. <laughs> to see what you're doing. Wow. Bhaktivinoda Thakur in Sajjana Toshini, he just speaks about different types of disciples, and there's Antar Muk and Bahir Muk, internal and external disciples. And amongst the external disciples, there's different types. There's a Sneha Silita, the Guru Giri, and the Vishayi. The Vishayi means someone who's addicted to sense gratification. There's two types. Uh, Anutap and Niranutap, someone who laments, feel bad, I can't follow the principles, but I really want to. Mm. And that devotee is Apichet Sudharacharo. He's actually a devotee. Mm. But the other type was Niranutap, who doesn't lament. He's just a bogus person. The other two, the Sneha Silita and the Guru Giri, my grandmas would describe them as a Narta Yukta Vasta. They have a Nartas in the heart. And so their darshan of Guru is Bogya Darshan. The Sneha Silita is someone who is looking for affection from Gurudev. Mm. And he wants to be near Gurudev and get attention and ride in the car with Gurudev and have Gurudev pat him on the head and things. Mm. And when Gurudev leaves the world, he becomes very confused. Right. He, he thinks, he doesn't want to say it, but he thinks Gurudev's dead. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says he's not dead. You're dead. Bhaktivinoda calls it Man Mora Bhav. He says, you're brain dead. Wow. You think your Guru Dave is gone. Just like we gave some class once in Vrindavan, and we spoke about how you should always be close to Guru. And afterwards, one Brahmachari came to me and said, that's nice, but my Guru Dave, I don't see him. I, I, I'm here in India, he's in America, I never get to see him, so how can I do this? And I told him, I said, please, I, I don't want to offend you, but I don't understand why you took initiation from someone if you think they're an ordinary person. And he was a little shocked. I, 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 I don't think like that. I said, well, if you think that material time or space can separate you from your guru, wow. then that means you think he's a material person, isn't it? Yeah. So that's the Sneha Silita. They, they, and after the disappearance of Guru, they have to replace him with someone else. Oh, Gurudev is gone. Now I, I have to find someone else. We need Siksha. We need guidance. Gurudev may be there in the presence of his instructions. He, Guru Maharaj, he, my Guru Maharaj told his friend Jagadatma Prabhu, his Prabhupada's disciple, who took second initiation from my Guru Maharaj, and uh, so much guidance from him. Guru Maharaj told him, you don't need to have Siksha after I leave. Not everybody has to have that. He said, but uh, if we do need that, how am I going to get that? Hmm. That's a question. I can run here and there and try to find so I can ask Nam Russ, I can watch your program and find out who the best guru is. <laughs> and maybe I might get some idea, I don't know. Right. Or maybe I might just get cheated. 
from your program, I don't know. Mm. But if I depend on my Gurudev, on someone I already have a connection with, if I please him, then he'll send that to me. So we went to, a little after that, we went across the Ganga to uh, Navadweep and we visited Shil Bhaktivedanta Narayan Marsh. Mm. And we asked him the same question, what should we do? And he told us that we should stay in ISKCON. And he said, you should find one of your god brothers amongst you and work with him. And we told him at that time we didn't see anybody like that. Right. But that was his first instruction. And I've marked with so many sadhus that that's their instruction. You stay with your family, and you depend on Krishna, and you do your service to Guru. After my grandma left, I stayed in Bhuvaneshwar, and I was doing my service. And one of my god brothers, who loved me, came to me, and he said, well, what are you doing here, man? He said, you should come. We were with the sadhu. We were with this nice sadhu. You should come and do sadhu sangha. And I told him, I said, that's good. I, I appreciate it. I like your sadhu. He's a good sadhu. And I agree, sadhu sangha is so important and so wonderful. I said, but can you look me in the eye? And can you tell me if I go there that I'll be able to continue Guru Maharaj's service? Hmm. I said, Guru Maharaj trusted me. He told me to make this magazine. He told me to write things. How can I give that up? And I told him, I said, I have faith that Guru Maharaj wants me to have sadhu sangha more than I do. And if I please him, he'll take care of me. Yeah. And my friend said, oh, I, I, I guess so. <laughs> I became a little annoyed. What do you mean you guess so? How can you doubt that? Of yeah. course he'll take care. So we should have full faith in Guru. And if we don't have full faith in Guru, then why did we go to him in the first place? Hmm. Then we should find someone else so we can take Siksha from, that we do have full faith in. Right. Uh, some people take initiation or, or take shelter of Guru at a very young age. And then when they get older, they might feel that, oh, it's, um, maybe I did, was a little bit premature or whatever. I mean, what, would you, what advice would you give someone like that? It's the same kind of thing as marriage, right? I, I remember in Los Angeles years ago, there was one Guru Kuli girl who was about 16 or 17. And she married a 40-year-old Prabhupada disciple. Hmm. And it seemed like a good idea. Everybody said, yes, Prabhupada said. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and it didn't work. Right. It was a sad thing. Yeah. So we should be very, very careful. We, we say, Janmi, Janmi, Prabhu say, we, if you're, st you're stuck with your husband, your wife, <laughs> for one life. But Guru is something we should have this consideration. I have so much faith. Now, Jiva Goswami says a very interesting thing in Bhakti Sundarva. He says, what if you took initiation from someone with the understanding that this person is an eternal associate of the Lord, a pure devotee, Krishna's representative, but later on you come to the understanding, the feeling that he's not. Mm. What should you do? He doesn't say that you've realized, because we don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. As we often comment, Garuda is a non-vegetarian Vaishnav. <laughs> so someone may be initiated by Garuda if you see him chowing down on some fish or something. Yeah. Oh my God, how can he do that? You may say, but he's, he's a pure devotee. Yeah. So we should have firm faith, that faith in the instructions, in that the Guru gives us proper instructions, that's the basis of our bhakti. If he tells us to chant Hare Krishna, read Srimad Bhagavatam, offer everything to Krishna, those are good instructions. Hmm. And if I have firm faith in him, everything will be okay. But if I lose that faith, then what to do? In that case, Jiva Goswami says you should find someone else who's descended from the spiritual world. He says, if you can't find that person, <laughs> then you should find someone who's a pure devotee. Hmm. Now, what does it mean, a pure devotee? I don't know who's a pure devotee, but from my perspective, and that's always what it is. But once one devotee came to me and he said, you know, Madhavananda, some devotees are saying that, and that Guru Maharaj is the Acharya after Prabhupada. What do you think of that? And I said, well, that sounds nice, right? but isn't it up to Krishna? Or are we supposed to vote about it? Mm -hmm. It has no meaning. What is my opinion? Yeah. What is the value of that? Right. And therefore, my Guru is stressed repeatedly that we should depend on Krishna and cry to Krishna in the heart, and Krishna will take care mm. according to the degree of our sincerity. That's such an important thing. Yeah. Krishna will take care. So we may do something premature, 
Sure. But then later, if we if we see that we feel that, then we don't commit offense. We don't criticize that person. They helped us. But then, then we pray to Krishna, you please send me someone that I have faith in. Right. Um, I was just going to ask you some. Oh, yes. If, if, if you could um, kind of put in into a sutra or some even short few sentences, what would you say is the, the main focus or the main teachings your Guru Maharaj gave in all the classes that you've heard? What did he kind of repeat over and over again that you would say is like the... The cream of, of what what his message was. Okay, you're asking me through my lens. Yes, through your <laughs> lens, of course. It's, yeah. it's a relative question. Yes, of course. What I heard from him repeatedly is you're not the seer. You're not the seer. Rather, you should be the seen. You should act in a way that Krishna will see you. Hmm. And, and, and he repeated over and over again. He told us, he said that Krishna Kata is life. And there's no Krishna Kata. He once told the devotees, he said, you don't know I'm in a very dangerous situation. If I don't speak, if I don't have Krishna Kata, I'll, I'll die. I'll, wow. I'll leave my body. Wow. So for me, those two things. I'm not the seer, and Krishna Kata is the most important thing. Mm. And that, I see that as the essence of our movement, the essence of our relationships, the essence of everything, the essence of our kirtan. You can't separate kirtan from Krishna Kata. You can't separate Krishna Kata from kirtan. Hmm. The two should go together. So, if uh, in the same line of of that, if if at a kirtan mela or, or or at a big kirtan festival, if we add Krishna Kata somehow, what what would it be? Would it be like a class beforehand, or have a class in the middle of it, or practically what would it look like? It's difficult if you want to make a, a rule about it, you want to make a resolution or something, <laughs> then it did, the whole purpose is kind of defeated. I see. I take part every year in the Bhakti Sangam festival in Ukraine. It's the biggest festival outside of Mayapur, the Gaur Purnima festival. And in one year they had 14,000 devotees that, that came. It's, it's crazy off the charts. And they sometimes have... 14,000 devotees? Devotees coming. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't even it's think a, there's... A... It's a devotee festival. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. The same person I was mentioning who was complaining about ISKCON yeah. on Facebook, I posted a photograph on the Bhakti Sangam festival from the Kirtan. 14,000 Russian devotees crying. And I said, for me, this is ISKCON. Wow. I don't care about your GBC and that I, I respect them, but this is ISKCON. Devotees coming together and crying and chanting Krishna's name. Wow. But at that festival, they have maybe 15 different speakers. Oh. And the talks are going on simultaneously in, in different venues throughout the day. Maybe there's four different time slots for speakers and in the evening everybody comes together for kirtan. So some devotees are going and hearing from Naranja Maharaj, some devotees are going and hearing from Banu Maharaj, some are hearing from Indra Maharaj or this one or that one. I'm, I'm also going and giving classes and we have a group of devotees who come and that group of devotees are very tight with you. Mm. And then there's some conception, joint conception there. Right. Because Krishna Kata is not something that, that you can legislate like that. Kirtan, you can legislate a little more. Mm. But but uh, Krishna Kata, you can't do that. So I, I, I don't know an answer to your question. I think it's nice, but it's not something to legislate. It hurts my heart if you, if I to think about making an official rule. But we're going to do this an hour before we have our Kirtan. Sure, we're sure, have yeah, Kata. It has to be somebody that the devotees really love. Yeah. And the devotees have faith in. It's a natural thing. It, it can't be legislated. You can't legislate faith. And this is a big problem that I have with devotees uh, about the guru system. They say that, that, that you, know, you have to accept this particular person as a guru. You can't legislate my faith. Sometimes devotees, they say the temple president is like a guru. The temple president is not my guru. Yeah. He's a manager. I respect the service he's doing. I want to cooperate with him because it's a very difficult service. Sure. But don't rape me. Don't rape means when you force someone into something. Don't try to force me to have faith in someone. You can't legislate faith. It's so true. And in and, and bhakti, that's such an important thing. Krishna Kata and Kirtan both are saying things that can't be legislated. Yeah. We, we can make schedules and do this and that. We can tell devotees we're all going to come together for Kirtan. And if you do like that, sometimes it becomes a little musical. It becomes right. a little external. 
because this is the official thing we all do together. But if there's somebody that you really love, I know Genevieve, she's really, she's famous as a kirtania, hmm. but I know one thing about her that I really appreciate too. She doesn't like it when devotees only think of her as a kirtania, as only as a singer. Hmm. She's got something to say also. Right. She wants to speak. Jamuna is one of her heroes, one of my heroes. And she's not just a singer, but she had so many things to say. Mm. And we should hear from someone, we should do kirtan with someone that we love and that we have faith in. It's a whole different thing than just going and hearing from somebody who's, man, that guy's the greatest musician, he's got a great voice. Then it becomes something musical. And it's yeah. okay because the holy name is there. Right. We appreciate it, but it can be a lot better. Mm. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Um, what, did I, what else did I want to ask you? Um, I feel like I feel like kirtan nowadays. Yeah, it's it's become it's become a lot about because the younger generation who don't know, who haven't read or who haven't who are not kind of in tune with the shastra and everything. They 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 the, what's attractive is you know the kind of uh, in the flashiness of it, and I think that uh, that's troublesome because then you're just creating that for the future and i think that we should really think about you know adding krishna katha to all I, I i had this idea um you know we should like they have the sadhu sangha festival or they have the kirtan mela we should have like a hari katha mela yeah and just have uh just classes but it's always going to be difficult if we don't have faith in that I, you know, it's interesting when you were saying this thing about the young people being attracted by flash. I wouldn't exactly totally agree with it all the time. I think sure. if, if they look deeper in their own hearts, yeah, they, it may seem like that. Oh, this guy's got a lot of tattoos. He's got some cool body piercing. His hair is like this or that. You know, right. He's a real rad person. <laughs> but they're actually not attracted by the tattoos or by the body, but they're attracted by the spirit of that person. Hmm. And part of the spirit is maybe like Madhav, my dear friend. Yes. I, I tell people sometimes I'm I'm Ananda because of Madhav. <laughs> Madhav Ananda. <laughs> right. And someone maybe if they think they're attracted by his tattoos or piercing or something, I don't think so. They're attracted by his spirit. Yes. And they should see that in a deeper way, because if, if they may think, well, it's just cool, I'll, I'll get a tattoo like him, hmm. and I'll and then I'll be like Madhav. Yeah. You won't be like Mod if you get a tattoo like him or have a body piercing like him. You have to have Madhav's heart. Yes. You have to do all the hard work that he did for years in Vrindavan, doing 24-hour kirtan with Ayendra and, and yeah. staying up all night and really putting in his time and years to get some heart like that. Mm. And that's what people are really looking for. So when we, we, we say that people are looking for something shallow, and sometimes it looks like that, mm. I think if we actually get them to look a little deeper, yes, they'll they'll understand themselves. You know, you're right. I, I'm not just looking for yeah. you know, some wild-looking person, but I'm looking for for the, their mood that, that I'm attracted by. Definitely, yeah. That's that's a that's a great point. Um, do you have any closing statements? Closing words? I think we've come to an hour and a half. Okay. Anyway, thank you, Nam Rasu. I, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank this you. program, you're trying to make devotees. This is what I see of, of your your uh, podcast program. You want to make devotees think. You want to take things outside of the box. You want to uh, make people a little more personal, sure, less institutional. And I, I really appreciate that. I thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I I appreciate you coming to my house and staying with me. And, and you fed us too. <laughs> No, no, I didn't. I actually did it. Mataji actually fed us. Um, but um, I really appreciate you coming here and, and sharing your, your thoughts and, and your perspectives. I think are really valuable. And I'd love to have you on again. And we can discuss other things. I have a few more things to, to ask you. But we, this is the time we have for today. Um, if someone wants to get in contact with you, how, what's the best way? Um, well, they can write to us. We have an email address. Uh, Kata, K A T H A, at the rate Gopal, G O P A L, Ju, J I U, dot org. And we have our email magazine. This is our little advertisement thing we put up for it. 
for our Krishna Katami to Bindu. Oh, okay. You can see the email address down Sure, there. yeah. If you can just pause it and look at yeah. the email address here. And that's uh, a free email magazine if anybody wants to subscribe because we're on a mission from God. And our mission is we, we think there should be more Krishna Kata. Krishna Kata, <laughs> that's the name of the game. I, I feel really inspired to uh, get more into Krishna Kata I, I really, after I really appreciated to you. your podcast you did with Hari Parsha Babu also. Yes, He's yes. a wonderful part of our project. And yes. Great devotee. And, and so many wonderful devotees you're interviewing and bringing on so much nectar from. Yes, you. you're one of them. Hi, <laughs> Thank you, Babu. Hi, well. Hi, Krishna. That's episode 21 with Madhavananda Prabhu. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching. Hi, Bo. Hi, Krishna.